Hi everyone, great that you're all here. So as you all know, we are here to welcome Maria Koinova to our seminar to here at St. Anthony's and CSOCs. But before I introduce her more uh, broadly, I want to pass the floor to Othon and Manolis, I guess, well, and others here, but yeah. Othon above all, to introduce yeah. this whole series that we are going to be with for the whole term um, related to our work on the Greek diaspora in a comparative perspective um, in Southeast Europe and informed by broader theories and analysis of diaspora. So it's really, um, I'm very, very happy. I know I'm going to learn a lot from the whole series uh, and I'm very much looking forward to today. And let me first let Othan introduce this overall series. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Calypso. And, uh uh, this series is actually part of our CISOX Diaspora project, which is uh, a flagship uh, pro project at, uh, at CISOX. And on behalf of uh, my co conveners as well, Manolis uh, Pratsinakis, who can also you know, uh, comment and add uh, um, to the things that I'm going to say, and Fotini Kalanzi, who's not here with, uh, with us today, she had to do an operation, um, I would like to welcome you to the seminar series. Uh, and uh, hopefully all of you have got this uh, little brochure, which is about um, the, the seminars that um, uh, uh, compose this seminar series, which is very thematic, and it's about comparative diasporas. Uh, three years ago, we started this project on uh, the Greek Diaspora Project, uh, which was based on funding from private donors. And uh, we are a team of um, experts uh, that uh, we are pursuing our own entrepreneurial uh, uh, you know, uh, dream of, uh, of discussing and uh, analyzing uh, diasporas. Uh, so um, uh, it's very much also in the context of global CISOX because we want to look at the region from a global uh, perspective. And diasporas are very, are very much part of this uh, um, uh, uh, global aspect. It's not about the region talking with itself. Uh, in the context of conflicts and, and, and wars or with the European project, but it's also about um, uh, diasporas in the, um, uh, in the wide world. Uh, now, we, um, the, the, the Greek uh, uh, project is about uh, the economy, the politics and philanthropy. We are looking at this uh, through surveys and uh, the digital world. Uh, we've got a, a map on, uh, on um, uh, Greek uh, organizations and, um, and diasporic uh, kind of groups uh, around the world. Uh, we are uh, doing analysis on, on these fields and also we want to be policy relevant. Now, what about this particular uh, the, uh, seminar series? Now, we consider the region to be very rich, uh, both uh, in terms of substance and, and things that are happening and, and diversity, uh, but also um, uh, in terms of uh, diasporic populations. In some cases in, in, in particular, like the case of Greece or Albania, when Maria has got the numbers for, of the Albanian communities around the world, you realize that even you know, the diasporic populations are half the population that it is in the homeland. Um, and uh, that makes some very, very interesting examples because there's a lot of impact uh, of the diasporas uh, to, the, to the homeland. And that's something that we really want to examine uh, even further and co comparatively, uh, but also because we want to submit uh, uh, eventually, when I say eventually soon, uh, on a you know on a more academic funding to do this uh, project uh, comparatively, uh, so <clears throat> this particular series and you can see the titles here, uh, which uh, have a special significance in themselves as titles, but also then you look at the abstracts as well. Uh, it is about um, uh, the region, and uh, there are uh, four or five particular things that I would like to mention about this that you can see them also you know in the titles of the seminars. The first one is that there is interdisciplinarity. So we're looking into the region through the seminar series from different disciplines, from political science, international relations, sociology, anthropology, political economy. That's the first. The second one um, is about uh, special, uh, speciality, which is it looks at uh, the region uh, in terms of uh, you know, countries, like from Cyprus and Turkey to Bulgaria, Romania, Albania, and uh, the uh, post-Yugoslav uh, states. The third issue that comes, you know, uh, very um, uh, eloquently here is uh, is the diversity in the region, and uh, you notice in the in, in the titles that you've got the terms contested, uh, fragmented, transnational. All these, uh, you know, denote the actually the dynamic approach that we want to take uh, with our uh, understanding of diaspora. Then we look at types of engagement as well. 
Um, and there are terms like activism in there, entrepreneurship, mediation, uh, and that uh, migration, remittances, the term migration, remittances, and all this, you know, show the different ways that diasporas, uh, in, you know, interact either with each other or with, uh, with their homeland. And finally, there are um, uh, titles and, uh, and um, uh, uh, concepts here which have to do with citizenship, identity, community, and that is actually the sense of belongingness. You know, how do you relate to your homeland or how do you relate to, you know, to the whole state or to the more transnational uh, environment. So these are issues that appear in our, uh, in our seminars. Uh, we consider this to be very important in our thinking and in comparing, obviously, with um, you know, uh, uh, all the different countries. It's interesting that if you look at the different states, uh, you realize how different they are from each other. And uh, you know, there's an interesting typology within, uh, you know, when you look at the countries themselves. Uh, so with that, uh, I don't know whether Manolis would like to add something to, to this. Uh, and, you know, go back to I'm Galicia. sure he will jump in at, at the Q&A <laughs> period very uh, brilliantly. Um, so indeed, uh, having heard Othon's introduction, it really makes sense that we start um, with a, a, a talk from Maria Koinova. Uh, first of all, just to remind everyone that Maria is a reader at Warwick um, and has published in particular, um, her last book is Ethno-Nationalist Conflict in Post-Communist States, Varieties of Governance in Bulgaria, Macedonia and Kosovo, a book which she presented here uh, a few, a few, Four, five, five years, years ago, few years ago yeah. already. God, time flies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so it's really wonderful to have you back, especially because since then, uh, Maria, you have directed this amazing uh, project, yes, ER European Research Council uh, project on diasporas and contested sovereignty 2012. 20, so these five years until last year, and so in a way you're presenting the result of a project that was, that had a team of four or five PhDs, and that was comparing against uh, between countries, so one from our mm -hmm. area in Kosovo, but also Palestine, um, etc. And you'll say much more. Mm -hmm. So there is the comparative, there is the interdisciplinary, there is the notion uh, indeed of entrepreneurship. Um, and, and also questions of identity. And in fact, linking to the contested theme, you, you, bring, you will bring to us um, these ideas of co conflict-generated diaspora um, and, and explain more what this means and the relations with elite. Um, so all of it, it, it is being clear to us, and of course you've published very, very broadly on diaspora and migration and you play with concepts as well as practice. So, in other words, you bring all of the building blocks that we mm -hmm. need ourselves to go forward with our project on, on the das Greek diaspora and comparative perspective. And I'm very much looking forward both to your talk, but also to continuing to work together in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this generous introduction. Thank you for the invitation. It has been a really uh, nice uh, uh, opportunity to work and to collaborate even a bit more from a distance uh, with the colleagues from the Greek Diaspora project, uh, but I see that it has taken off very nicely, so congratulations for that. Uh, and this is really nice that you are trying to look into different uh, comparative perspectives. Um, Calypso mentioned that this was a big project of the European Research Council, which I won in 2011, started working in 2012. It basically was five years and eight months. Um, so uh, the central question around which I have worked with the team of people has been about um, under what conditions and by way of what causal mechanisms diasporas mobilize when they're conflict-generated diasporas, and it's important to think about that these are refugees and their descendants, it's not simply migrants who have gone there for voluntary purposes, uh, and how do they mobilize transnationally for uh, polities that experience contested sovereignty. In a world in which we live under globalization, every country is experiencing contested sovereignty, and we see all the debates that have been going on with with the UK, for example, the contested sovereignty. But the contested sovereignty we talk about here in this project is more about weak and de facto states where institutions are weak, where borders are challenged, where internal governance is challenged, so something that we do not experience uh, in the UK, even though um, there is an experience with uh, uh, perceptions of contested sovereignty. 
So this was the design of the project. Um, we were looking into specific types of polities. Uh, I had my own project of uh, diasporas and uh, de facto states of Kosovo, Palestine, and Nagorno-Karabakh. And I will tell you more about this as my presentation is based uh, particularly on that uh, uh, section. Uh, there was a postdoc who worked on the Kurdish diaspora with stateless diaspora, um, and two uh, PhD students who worked on states uh, that are existent on the uh, map of the world, uh, like Iraq and Bosnia, but they are challenged very much domestically. So basically, we worked a lot through the concepts of uh, uh, Krasner, uh, that m most of you probably know of his work, um, uh, Sovereignty Organized Hypocrisy, where he made a conceptualization of uh, sovereignty being discussed as internal, external, Westphalian, and uh, interdependence, and we focus particularly on the external and uh, uh, um, uh, in the internal dimension in order to see how diasporas are relating to that one and challenging. So as a certain, um, so the project uh, um, progressed from uh, qualitative uh, comparative studies to quantitative study. And uh, there was a large period of about a year and a half where we went through a lot of intercoder tests within the data so that we can gather from different researchers everything that is uh, being uh, comparable. And uh, from there we developed the survey uh, through which we can uh, test um, uh, through 3,000 respondents in among the Palestinian, or, um, Kurdish, and Iraqi diasporas in the UK, Sweden, and Germany. So you can imagine uh, what a task that was, and um, uh, that was difficult to execute, but I think at the end, uh, very rewarding. The most important thing, I think, with this idea is to start from the qualitative and then progress to the quantitative part was because in the process of the <coughs> qualitative part, we thought about initially there are home states, host states, and the diasporas, or these areas in which, from which they belong, right? Or they think that they belong or have this imagined uh, belonging. But the problem was that actually it does not work very much in this way. And Throughout the process, we started seeing new variables emerging, new codes, new elements, which became very important in order to consider the survey in different ways. So you would see at later points of time when the uh, findings of this research are coming uh, in the quali quantitative dimension, how much a transnational dynamic of contested sovereignty is already into that. And usually surveys that have been done so far are much more about state to state and what do migrants do and what, what states do, but not this transnational dimension. So where we started uh, to position ourselves in the literature, and Calypso mentioned that this is a very interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary project that you're working through, and that I have been working through. We started with literatures that were all over the place and were mostly case study oriented. So for example, some scholar, so our dependent variable, some the, the thing that we needed to explain was diaspora mobilization. While we thought that there are some partial explanations in literature which is about diaspora group characteristics. For example, if diasporas are very well organized or very uh, large, then they may have more mobilization <coughs> abroad. Other literature that was giving some insights was about hostage migration integration regimes. So some literature was saying that if uh, countries, if the um, uh, migrants or diasporas are not very well um, integrated into their societies, they will feel uh, very um, homeland oriented and they will be transnationally uh, active. And more recent literature, and especially in sociology, has shown the other way around, that the more integrated the people are, the more transnationally active they become. And, and still we are in that puzzle, where is the real world, right? What's really happening? So it needed more unpacking. Traditional political science literature has been on ethnic lobbying in foreign policy, uh, which has been seen, uh, for example, in the American context, how much different ethnic lobbies have sought um, to influence Congress and the Senate, specifically of the, the Congress, for foreign policy decision making. And yet, about Europe, very little is known. So that what we are producing in this uh, project has been uh, quite um, visible in the European, in the European uh, field and quite pioneering. 
Um, sociology has given us a lot of information about transnational processes, about uh, transnational social movements, but are diasporas really transnational social movements as the other, as, as the other social movements, as if you're climate change movement or gender movement or movement that is dealing with um, uh, revolutions or regime change? may not be the same. So some people, like Taro, spoke about rooted cosmopolitanism, but there was nothing more in that direction. In the meantime, a lot of things grew. So recently, for example, interesting work has been published by Moss uh, with regard to the Syrian diaspora and others, but it still is not a mainstream sociological topic. And the final part, which came quite at the later stage in the project, we saw a lot of systemic effects in the international system, important like critical junctures, transformative events, and also the sending states that approach diasporas around. Uh, all of these have not been integrated in the same discussion. They have been particularly in each of that because we had this question of diaspora mobilization, which is very central, which is very narrow we were able to sift through these whole processes of intercultural discussions uh, where we could do all of the understanding of which variables really matter and which don't. So here, I mean, this is how our comparative studies project looked like. It had original homeland, Kosovo, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, and Armenia there, uh, and certain Turkey, because it was really important for both Armenians and Kurds. Iraq and Palestine. And then there was a diaspora abroad, which sometimes did not correspond directly, right? Because a lot of Armenians, for example, live in Turkey, and then uh, um, Palestinians live in Iraq and Lebanon in other places, but I will come back to that one. And then <coughs> all of that was embedded in five countries in Europe, which were France, G Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, and the UK. And this was done because they were on a different um, <coughs> Uh, line of how in, in the of what type of integration regimes they had. So the UK has been traditionally considered more liberal context, while Germany on the other end has been considered much more closed in terms of migration integration regimes. So we had some variable, uh, independent variable on which to select in order to show uh, divergence. And the final part, the research which I did uh, in 2017, three months I spent in Brussels, I looked into how these diasporas mobilize on the level of European institutions. Um, okay, so this was the magnitude of the project that I mentioned, and I also said that we had this theory building to theory testing exercise where we launched into the field for about um, two years and a half, and then we did questionnaire, expert workshop, we did a pretest, the survey, and now we are doing the analysis. So different, so this is post project, uh, but a lot has been happening um, during that time and afterwards. So now um, that was more of the discussion about what was happening with regards to the larger project. And as I said in the beginning, I had my own sub project within that, apart from directing it and directing the work of the PhD students and the postdocs. So for me, <coughs> I will present to you uh, work that is in progress. It is a book manuscript. Um, and these are the central ideas of it, the central theoretical framework. And then there is also a lot of um, empirical evidence, mostly illustrative alongside the causal pathways that I have developed. And then we can um, discuss this or anything you're interested in with regard to the project. So my interest, I mean, also part of the project, but my interest specifically has been with regard to the diaspora entrepreneurs in terms of individual agency. And for me, this whole debate about whether if you are uh, integrated or not integrated has been really puzzling, matters. So if you want to look into why is it that some people, even if they integrated, are still mobilizing, you need to dig, dig, uh, dig deeper. And my puzzle has been that most diaspora entrepreneurs, if we look into them through the data sets and prior to that, they are well integrated people. They speak the language, they have jobs, socialize with other nationalities beyond their identity group, yet they mobilize differently. So what is the explanation about this? Does really migration integration regime matter? 
And over time, and I think that by the end of the book, I will have a serious argument with migration and integration regimes when it comes to entrepreneurship of diasporas because they may, it may not be as determinative as it is uh, thought uh, through, through the literature. So and my questions have been under what conditions and under, thank you, and uh, the, the, under what con the causal mechanisms this diaspora entrepreneurs mobilize for contentious and non-contentious ways or use dual-pronged approaches. So I see contentious ways in which, for example, diasporas may be interested in uh, more using of uh, violence um, or of um, the violent demonstrations or of boycotts. Uh, on the other side, non-contentious ways of mobilization are also existing. People are mobilizing for financial support, uh, for um, changing legislation, for policy change. And sometimes there are both happening at the same time. And I think this is the most interesting thing because initially if you look into contention, non-contention in the hotmost ways, it may be easier to go into the general discussion, are diasporas conflict actors or non-conflict actors that we see very much being a futile conversation because they can be both. The question is to understand how, when, and under what conditions. So this dual prompt approach, which I found uh, through a lot of my interviews, uh, has been really important. And this is not simply about the contention, right? Contention is one of the variables. And the other is about how do they channel this contention. And channeling can happen through the host state, through transnational channels, which are people-to-people -people networks. Or it can happen supranationally because we are especially in the, in the European context where the European institutions matter, where mobilizing for European elections may matter, where people send their uh, representations to build uh, uh, offices in Brussels and to influence the European Parliament and the Commission. So this matters. Right. These are the two elements, the contention and the channeling. So my theoretical approach brings a relational theorizing into the this individual level. So I'm not looking, first of all, into groups. This idea about diasporas are not groups has been started to be unpacked, but then the groups are, some people say that there are some smaller groups within them, but then we are going, I'm going even further by saying, let's look at what happens on the individual. This hasn't happened earlier. And then you could look into individual level, from example, from identity-based characteristics. This is not something I'm looking into. And probably it will be challenging to understand this um, socio-spatial context that I drew a lot of um, uh, graphs and figures. But I'm bringing a relational perspective socio spatially how people are embedded in different contexts simultaneously, how one is both with one foot in the homeland and in a hostland, or vice versa. You will see um, I'm coming to that. So I think that this uh, book is um, um, unpacking the relative strength and weakness of these socio-spatial linkages. Um, that's why I'm developing a typology of configurations. And uh, I'm coming back to that uh, in a while, but this is a very important central idea. Of, like it's a, how people are connected to different places, typologizing about that has not been done. Apart from that, uh, I'm bringing typological theorizing, something that hasn't been done uh, before in diaspora politics, and I think in qualitative uh, studies still is making its way uh, onto the comparative QCA analysis, uh, analysis, but two-level typological theories are not there. So that's why I emphasized earlier that there are two elements that I'm trying to explain, the, both the contention at one time and then the channeling of interest at the other. So if you look into um, how modes of mobilization of contention matters, which is my dependent variable, the diaspora entrepreneur is not simply, is a person, it's a physical person, but not through their individual characteristics identified. This is not the person who has a specific type of education or specific type of migrant experience, etc. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that there could not be clustering within different groups but that the person is connected specifically to different contexts and, and has these specific socio-spatial linkages. So this is one of my variables with four different types. 
Then I develop in the book um, this idea after um, I will discuss in a while uh, the politically relevant environment of external factors which are impacting on these diaspora entrepreneurs and they impact on them differently. They do not de do this to everybody in the same way. If you think about oh, what is an impact on a group, it may be one way to think about this, but not every critical juncture has the same impact on different people in the diaspora. And this is what it matters, and I'll, I'll come back to the unpacking of this. And then all of this in this combination explains the diaspora mobilization. I'm trying to move away from methodological nationalism, which is thinking about, although I'm working on states, like four, five states plus I added Brussels at the end, I'm trying to look from the point of view that the state is extraterritorial, the relationships to the state are extraterritorial, that the state reaches out extraterritorially, and that diasporas in host states and other international institutions are also in this extraterritorial dynamic. I use structure fat, uh, focus comparison, which I think is uh, quite known to this uh, <coughs> audience, and Asisyphus' work about above 300 <coughs> interviews, which I collected myself on top of everything. Um, I went, I counted 40 locations in Europe and the neighborhood that I was there myself. Um, and uh, in the UK, Sweden, Germany, Netherlands, and France. And then I added at the end for specifically for Kosovo, also Switzerland, a couple of interviews there. I did three months uh, interviews in Belgium and then also in Kosovo and Armenia. So you can imagine how much work I do with that. Um, and without that large scale support of the European Research Council, I have to say that this kind of comparative study would never have been possible because it did require one interview tool, which was my questionnaire of semi-structured interviews applied comparatively through these countries. So I think that the theories that are emerging out of this project and in this book are therefore quite legitimate from that grounded theory point of view. It's not something imposed from theory onto the, um, uh, onto the empirics, but the empirics are developing a theory which is uh, very comparative and has uh, multiple implications uh, uh, throughout Europe, which would not be if it's one case. Right? And uh, I did a lot of coding uh, according to um, the coding manual of Saldana and also tried to innovatively do this by way of relational linkages. So diaspora entrepreneur is central to this, uh, uh, to this project um, and I want to say what I understand by diaspora entrepreneur and what I don't. So these are social and political entrepreneurs, not simply activists or business entrepreneurs. Because activists uh, may be people who are given up projects from their activist networks. The entrepreneurs are the ones that usually invent, design, think about uh, certain ideas, uh, certain projects. For example, one thing would be to be an activist in a network that uh, um, implements existing modes of mobilization. And there would be to be innovative. And I have to tell you in Sweden, for example, when some uh, Turkish official was visiting and because of the mobilization for the Armenian genocide, there were activists who said, okay, we are going to implement different, different uh, uh, projects of what is usually going on. We are gonna demonstrate and so on. And others came up with a really original idea. And this was how to uh, have banners uh, uh, fly, uh, being flown, um, flying from an airplane uh, at the site. And this kind of innovative ideas uh, that are there. So this could be formal and informal. Um, I know that maybe a lot of uh, people in the scholarly community would consider elites versus masses, where this um, is not exactly that one because it, it um, spreads itself throughout. One can be a um, member of parliament, one can be a director of a migration institution, one can be a shop <coughs> owner. And shop owners are very important for mobilization and they invent a lot of things and they organize a lot of people. Uh, shop owners, uh, restaurant owners. Um, in Berlin, it was amazing how many Albanians had 
restaurants and how they have managed to mobilize over the years for Kosovo independence. Um, so if we try not to see the world in the ways in which political science has been seen it as elites and masses, but try to open up in terms of networks and those who are having entrepreneurship in networks is a different way um, of conceptualizing and operationalizing it. Um, some of these ideas are bringing um, support from the work of uh, Jennifer Brinkerhoff. She has a very interesting book on uh, uh, institution building and diaspora entrepreneurs. Um, with her, it's mostly about uh, uh, people who are in, in business uh, and by way of that in politics. Uh, mine are more uh, with regard to variety um, of entrepreneurship when it comes to social inventions of how to deal with issues of contested sovereignty. And diaspora mobilization is building on the work of social movements, Tilly Taro, Akadam, Adal, where individual and collective actions of identity-based social entrepreneurs um, are considered to organize and encourage migrants and other descendants uh, to um, in concerted uh, ways to make claims. Claims making is very important here in this project because if you think about capturing the truth when you make interviews uh, about when, whether somebody really participated or not or really made claims or not, it's really important to understand that sometimes diaspora entrepreneurs are making claims about issues that then become implemented and sometimes they do not but the Actual engagement is a, a one of one part of what they really are claiming, and sometimes claims become become very important themselves. Um, I have uh, operationalized <coughs> the mobilization on a contentious, non-contentious, and dual prong approach, which I mentioned in the beginning about the different ways in which I follow them through interviews and secondary data uh, analysis. The contentious ways are considered transgressive in, in social movements in terms of that they are going beyond the rules of which are already established. Protests, boycotts, sit-ins, hunger strikes, drafting of shoulders, soldiers, and all of them are in the book. Non-contentious are considered contained. In the Makada Medal uh, context, this could be petitions, lobbying, media engagement, diaspora, diplomacy, etc. And I think the most interesting thing is that they are approach about the two of them. Uh, coinciding together. I mentioned also the channel of interest. You can do it through host state, transnational, and supranational channels. So here I come about the theoretical part. In, in 2017, I published an article which was called Diaspora Positionality in IR, uh, Beyond Status Paradigms. Um, and this is a figure which I took from there because this is on what I build. Uh, I mean, this figure is not in the book, but this is what I build on. And the idea is that we do not think... Reminds me of the little prince. <laughs> oh. You know, the hat or the elephant. <laughs> so a nice a boa that had this. swallowed an elephant. I don't know if you know what I mean. <laughs> you have this shape, and is so it a hat or is it an elephant? <laughs> so funny. Or is so, it a spoon? <laughs> yeah, but that... Um, so this is the idea that, it, uh, that mobilization does not happen in one... Uh, in uh, host states, home states, and diaspora. So this tri triangular relationship somehow is being unpacked. And they do operate in transnational social fields, which is an idea of the transnational social, social movements and sociology. But the novelty, I think, of this uh, idea has been about the positionality of these diasporas in different contexts, which hasn't been considered neither in IR nor in, in um, uh, sociology, uh, at least not in these terms, in socio-spatial terms. So this agent, let's say, is a Palestinian living in the UK. Agent A is not connected simply to West Bank and Gaza, that may be considered the home state, which probably is very questionable, which is A, but it's connected to B, which is uh, Lebanon, with a lot of uh, camps. Uh, still uh, inhabited by generations of Palestinians. It's connected also to Egypt, where lots of people got uh, their education or transited from. Uh, it's connected to Jordan, a country that uh, managed for a long time to um, govern over um, the West Bank and eventually lost that uh, territory. 
Um, it's connected uh, to the larger Maghreb region, it's connected to Europe, it's connected to the States and to Latin America. So this is the transnational social field. The question is that this, I mean, agent E is, is specifically empowered by their connectivities, not simply to the hostland context in which they are, in this case, the Palestinian, the UK, but simultaneously also by the collectivities to another. If you are a Palestinian living in the UK and you're connected to the Gulf countries, you may have one way of positioning yourself to be able to inform politics or mobilize for political issues than if you're connected to Lebanon. Like, so either if it's physically here, you may be in a different way connected and positioned. And this Sorry, is could just because I keep on wondering about this, Sorry to interrupt, but is it they mobilize themselves or they ma mobilize others when you say they mobilize, mobilize others? Because right. here your whole story, that's what I un understood, but your story is more like here's this individual and how does he or she they, they mobilize have, themselves or is it that they you know, mobilize a whole group of people maybe in different places? Mm -hmm. So um, they, for example, the, the Palestinian that I mentioned here, if they're connected to the camps in Lebanon, they may be much more engaged with drawing expertise from there, traveling to there, knowing what's happening there, mobilizing certain networks here that are connected to this place or that are having interest in mobilizing for that place. Others maybe for Gaza. I'm coming to that moment, I, that, that is my figure about the four types of diaspora entrepreneurs. I try to clean it as much as possible, in which I see the Diaspora entrepreneurs has four types. The broker is the red one where they are simultaneously strong to, to, to three types of conflict context, but the hostland is the one and the uh, homeland is another, but that could be also another global context. Right? That person is brokering, moving along, is having a lot of relationships with them. So they are very multifunctional in all of them. The local is somebody who is under the host state, host state literature, the one that is quite integrated, quite local, quite engaged in local politics. Many people are there because they immigrate, they become integrated and they stay there. They may maintain some relationship to the homeland and another context, but their primary ways in which they mobilize, engage, is in the hostland. Then I think it's interesting category of the distant that I call that person, um, which is who is the person who is physically here, but is emotionally uh, con in terms of connectivity somewhere else. And this may be considered the non-integrated person through the traditional literature, right? But if you look into the data, many of these people are quite integrated. They speak the language, they have education, they have means of everything. So we started already unpacking this idea about who is integrated and who is not. And is really integration the most important thing and to what degree it really matters. A lot of distance have been um, associated, for example, with conflict periods. But they exist also in post-conflict periods. But the fact that there is a violence going on in the country of origin may contribute to the existence of the distant. And distant is not a permanent category. It's a socio-spatial category because you can move away from it. And the cost of case is very nicely showing this. People who might be integrated, quite well integrated at a certain point of time, they may move from the context of being a distant to a broker. Usually they move in this direction or become local on the other way around. So somebody who was broker during the war said, I'm not really interested, I'm tossing all relationships back to Kosovo, I don't want to deal with this, I want my life here, and I become, lo basically, in my world, he becomes a local. So, and this is why I'm saying it's not simply about the person, their educational level, their integration level, but where do their allegiances and contacts lie at particular points of time, which is very socio-spatial. Uh, socio-spatial um, logic. Pardon? The P? Oh, the, the oh, sorry, that's the passive. That's the <laughs> passive that I'm still searching uh, probably a better word for it. Maybe the rest, um, another uh, probably restrained or uh, um, 
another one that is looking for, that is uh, connected to the homeland and the hostland, but is very weakly connected to both, right? They are living basically in the hostland, also physically, right? but they do not have strong relationships to institutions and they do not have strong relationships to home. They are mostly in a communal area and sometimes they become very active and you will see when they become very active actually under critical junctures and when they, they can be very autonomous. So the one, you remember that discussion about uh, the dependent variable, the independent variable one, which was the, this type of four types of diaspora entrepreneurs, and they were impacted on the, from this politically relevant environment. The politically relevant environment is derived to a certain degree from Mao's work from 1996, which is a politically relevant international environment. I can engage in the Q&A session, why is it that it's a different concept, but in terms of like the logic, it is about this, that not each, so he was thinking about how different countries are impacted by different international uh, factors in different ways and we cannot think about realist theories or we can think of liberal theories or neoliberal theories but we can think about this in very um, uh, geopolitical terms. And while 1996 uh, is a long time ago, uh, at that time uh, that kind of uh, thinking was quite iconoclastic and over time it, with the entry of spatial politics and uh, political geography into IR, I think it became the idea about different countries and different agents being impacted in different ways became uh, much more open. So here, what I'm saying is that for a different diaspora entrepreneur, so I, I transpose this from one level to the individual level, and I, I'm saying that for a certain diaspora entrepreneur, not everything in that context will matter in the same way. So if you are a Palestinian in the UK, and we're getting, keep on getting this uh, context, something that happens, uh, let's say, in the Balkans or something that happens in Asia and really may have implications on human rights and, and, and migration politics and even may have connection, distant connection to the Palestinian issue, but people would not be very connected to it because they need to be, first of all, connecting to their uh, diaspora conflict-generated grievance, has, has to have uh, this impact, personal impact, and needs to be socio-spatially contiguous. The best idea about socio-spatial contiguity is uh, from my research in Berlin, for example. I ask people there different types of... You are completely in the place where a wall matters. Wall mattered, right? and you can still see the line there in that divide, was dividing East and West Berlin, do you use that as some way of mobilizing against the walls and settlements? And you could see among diaspora entrepreneurs who are brokers, who have had more bigger knowledge of the world, and they see, yeah, sometimes we bring up this issue, bring up this issue. When you go there and just like look into the local who has never been exposed to this issue, they don't think about this. It's foreign, right? So this shows the socio-spatial contiguity of the issue, how much it really can impact on the different people. And uh, uh, if you remember from the beginning, uh, we had different uh, literatures, but they are different part of the, um, that environment. Hostland foreign policy is one of the variables that really matters. I mean, even if people do not understand it, and I think that a lot of them act on perceptions rather than actual knowledge of what is going on in, in foreign policy, that matters. So this is part of the environment that does. If there are critical events, especially violent events, or even elections, contentious, contentious elections, and, and uh, more mobilization somewhere else, like, uh, for example, um, the Syrian war, that matters. And think about how much the Arab Spring did not impact on the Palestinian diaspora. It should have, right? But didn't. Um, Governments, uh, when they have a bigger reach to the diaspora abroad, they do it in specific ways, and sometimes do, they do, sometimes they don't, sometimes they have the capacity, sometimes they don't. And parties, we were talking about parties uh, uh, previously uh, before the beginning of this discussion, parties also have a very fragmented way of reaching out to the diaspora abroad. Some are doing it much more, uh, much more um, confidently and with interest, and others not. I think that this book is very interesting in the sense that it shows also the autonomy of diaspora entrepreneurs. Because sometimes we say, oh, diaspora, they are stooges of 
countries of origin or of mm. countries of settlement. They have, and you would see in my account that even under the most uh, problematic conditions, I think in the Palestinian case, but also during the, the warfare in the Kosovo case, there were somewhat in, independent people acting in different forms. And you could see about how much they did, maybe they didn't report their connections, but definitely there is some sort of autonomy in which some of them may be able to exert uh, autonomy because they are not um, and not, not uh, connected by homeland governments, there are no parties, and usually they may uh, engage on systemic effects like the critical junctures and from events. So this is the two-level technological theory. It looks like uh, proto uh, QCA, um, Q uh, qualitative comparative analysis. Um, it works only with the variables that are identified for this project. So the modes of contention, we remember, is the first element of the two-level theory that stays on the left side, and we see the non-contentious, contentious, and dual-pronged approach. And then the host-state uh, host foreign policy is basically a given uh, at a certain large period. And then you have alternations about how these homeland influences matter. Sometimes you have parties, sometimes you have governments, and you have systemic effects of critical junctures and transformative events, or you have very little influences on a certain person. And then I show how the local, the broker, the distant, and the passive are... Um, I'm sorry, so does that mean there's always ho host state foreign policy? That means that yeah. always there is a host state foreign policy. That matters. That matters, yeah. And then the others are in an alternation. Um, and they channel interest, which was the second uh, element that I wanted to explain in a different way. Like the broker does this mostly through, uh, through the hostland, transnational and supranational levels. The local is mostly hostland, but can because they do have on certain points of time connection transnationally. The distance is very strong transnationally. They mobilize in the field, for example. I think Kosovo was very interesting how during the war, uh, there was a lot of busing of people around Europe. Now, today, we are demonstrating in Paris. And Paris doesn't have a big community of, of Kosovars. The other day, we are demonstrating in uh, Geneva or in Gath. So that moving around was very important for, and that were a lot of that was either brokered by brokers or by the distance. And the passive is mostly engaged in the hostland. And I mean, still, this needs a, a little bit more of teasing out through the actual findings that, that I keep on finding. Uh, so that may endure a bit of um, change. But uh, this is where uh, the large uh, level typological theory is. So if you try to kind of look through it in a, again in a visual way, the, ho the broker is being impacted by these factors from their different arms, right? The arm to the home hostland and the arm to somewhere else. So all of these foreign policy influences and so on are impacting on them, and that's how they channel through the hostland, transnational, and supranational level. The local may not be that impacted for something happening abroad to a large degree, but something that is happening in the host country. The distance is the other way around. If something is happening more transnationally, it may have much more impact on them and the passive or preserved that I'm just thinking about changing potentially. So is the one that is being impacted by all of them, but the linkages are very weak. So something really needs to have a very strong impact on that. So how does, so, so in your table, you had host, land, uh, host state foreign policy was always there, but then now in the four categories, sometimes it's there and sometimes it isn't. No, it's, it's always, I mean, it's part of the prefactors. So this is the one of the prefactors. The other is our criti critical junctures and so on. So in terms of the causal pathways, the foreign policy is always existent. Because it always matters for, the, yeah, the, it always matters for a diaspora entrepreneur whether they do not have, the, whether they do have uh, no impact from external factors. Uh, external actors like uh, uh, parties or homeland governments and so, so on, they still live in that host state and they still may have grunches, uh, grievances against that policy. They may still want to change it. 
right? There is the one that really imp impacts on them. It's mostly perception, right? But then the others are more in variation. Sometimes you may be able to be, some, some people are approached by governments and some people are not approached by governments, but they still live in that host land, right? Okay, it's just that in the graphs, the dotted line means it's, because you have lines everywhere. There's never no line in any of your four. So just to understand the model. The model is that there um, are always impacts. It, there is always, have always the politically relevant environment is always there. It just has very differential impacts on the linkages. And that's what the linkages part is. That was it's like a relational analysis. And that's why it's not like static, it's relational. Um, I mean, I will give you an example. Um, uh, for example, the um, events in Charlie Hebdo. I mean, they are not foreign policy. In where? Charlie, Charlie Hebdo. Hebdo. Charlie, Hebdo. Mm -hmm. Charlie Hebdo had a huge impact on Germany and the Palestinian diaspora mobilization. Which got, this was kind of politically relevant environment because it triggered some issues with uh, anti-Muslim propaganda and how people mobilize, etc. So it has been very important for them. Not that much you could see in other contexts. Uh, because for some of these people in this context, that was really an important issue to mobilize about. I mean, we can discuss more later, but this was impacting on that host land dimension, like on that host land dimension it was impacting, but it was not impacting that much uh, in other contexts. Okay, so I have this many, um, many causal uh, chains, which are usually, it's our eight, and still probably needs to be twisted and tweaked because I have homelands, parties, but there need to be also non-state actors there in specific ways engaged. So I chose to look through the um, three causal pathways just to give you a, an illustration of, of how I think about that. If you think about the IVs and, and DVs, so this is how this causal pathway looks through. So if a non-contentious pathway, we have a foreign policy convergence, and this is in my cases, it's um, in Kosovo after 2008. I mean, it's not quite complete, but most of the cases that I did research in the countries, so UK, Sweden, Germany, Netherlands, and France, but also Belgium have been among the first to agree on uh, Kosovo's independence. So that's why I consider this um, convergence. There's a limited global influences in the sense that there is like no single very strong homeland influence, and there is no single party influence, but people are more autonomous. Um, and then I see into the different types, the broker, the local, the distant, and the passive. The distance is not as present in my data set, but it may be that it's a certain bias of, of the data, but it may be not exactly uh, the case, so that's maybe something to, to think about, but definitely the distance is part of other um, contexts. Uh, you may recognize this is uh, Rita Ora. Uh, Rita Ora has been considered an, an ambassador of Kosovo. She really received, uh, I think it was 2015 or 2016, um, um, honorary Kosovo ambassadorship uh, award. Um, and this has been because Senior. it's been important as big celebrity in world uh, in the world of entertainment controls enormous Where's power. For Kosovo. For Kosovo, yeah. She is born in Pristina and at age one apparently she migrated as part of this big wave and lives in London. I mean, this is where she uh, became educated and uh, became a celebrity. Right? But that she has been able through this huge impact to impact closely and transnationally, specifically. I mean, I don't see there was any any uh, movement into supranational levels or going to the European Union or something, but generally as a celebrity has been very important in this aspect. Oh, yeah. I mean, in the Can book... Like seven minutes or so? so yeah, we yeah in the book I have more information about, uh, about other uh, brokers. There was a local in Germany who, for example, was very much uh, engaged in bringing up uh, her, her own project about uh, uh, Mother Teresa and emphasizing that Mother Teresa is a person of Albanian origin. I mean, she was 
uh, born in Macedonia in Kosovo uh, um, as a part of the Albanian community and then she grew as an international person from there. So, mother so both countries claim her, right? Kosovo and Macedonia. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. the very Dual local. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I mean, this kind they of... They compete each other as well. Celebrity status, you yeah. can get the... Well, but the point is that this, for example, f frame of analysis and uh, framing of the issue is not as strong, let's say, in the UK. It's like other issues are here important. It's very important in Germany. And why is it in Germany? I mean, because it does have an appeal with, among Catholic groups, among people who are from the mainstream. So it is an important issue in Germany. Also, Mother Teresa society was very, very important in Germany for a very long time. So this socio-spatial embeddedness of the person in the German context matters. Um, so certain sort of um, um, autonomy was also, also among a person who could see, could be questionable whether they are a returnee or they are a diaspora, but I saw them shuttling a lot between two contexts, and this is associated with the ownership of the like a big complex outside of uh, Pristina uh, in Kosovo where a big uh, area has been built, the so-called Valley Ranch, and a lot of movement. different different things, an entertainment complex has a lot of also polit politicians there. So it is an interesting way in which that diaspora entrepreneurship happens. And on the reserved or passive side, I saw, for example, a teacher of Albanian English in Sweden uh, that they have posted the Kosovo flag right there next to other countries contested sovereignty. I mean that they are like existing countries. The question is that that it has been put in a classroom. Like, I mean you could see this performance of being an entrepreneur may not go really super loud, but in their daily life and so on that still exists there in specific ways. A contentious pathway uh, is when you have foreign policy divergence. I mean, I'm bringing here the examples from the, cost, from the Palestinian and Armenian exist, uh, experience and critical junctures which are really bringing content, contested, um, contested movements. Um, with the contentious pathway, we see a lot of protests and boycotts among the Palestinian case. Um, there are a couple of interesting quotes which I put here. Um, uh, there was a Palestinian in the Netherlands, for example, who was a member of a Dutch party participating in European communities, right? Somebody who is really a broker in the world uh, out there. And you could see in this quote how much that person is connected to Gaza uh, and the war in Gaza and to the BDS movement at the same time. So it's like all this length of the, the, the hands are not in one place, they are in all three places. What is happening in Palestine has big repercussions here. For example, what happened in Palestine in 2009 with the war in Gaza. I was living in a small city where I had recently moved. When the war happened, we returned from vacation. In one week, we could organize a big demonstration. If you go to ask them to demonstrate now, there is no answer. But what is happening in Palestine, what is happening in Europe, has a big influence on what we do. I'll give you an example about the BDS campaign. We started these individuals to give folders to people in supermarkets and talk to them about Palestine. So, I mean, there are other interesting quotes, uh, lots of interesting quotes in this study. Um, the local and the Karabakh movement, who uh, has been mostly engaged in the hostland, somewhat transnationally. And see how it sounds, the history. Regarding the Karabakh movement, we started reacting mostly after the pogroms in Sungai. It was against the Turks. So there were a lot of demonstrations here, but such were not directed against Gorbachev. He was, after all, the fast mastermind of the whole thing. But the Turks, the local Turks, apparently it's not about Turks, but about the Azeri people. And then uh, he says, and, and then at the time of the earthquake, uh, we engaged more through humanitarian effort. So basically that person's engagement was through developing awareness primarily in France, but then also on that specific moment, very much engaged um, uh, through humanitarianism in Karabakh. So from somebody in France was very well networked with the Maghreb, less so in France. I mean, you can imagine a person constantly moving in the Maghreb area and just physically there and having citizenship and so on. So he was um, basically saying that they have an organization which is uh, uh, very well networked with uh, Palestinians and Arabs and French and very much connected to the 
to the Middle East and uh, but also very much engaged through the Syrian and the Libyan conflicts and that has been part of that transnational experience that is impacting on them. Um, and the reserve, there was a family of my Armenians in, in Sweden, for example, who did not very much like to be engaged in political activities, but uh, when it came to the 24th of April, the day of the genocide, were members of, um, uh, of um, uh, the Armenian genocide, they get engaged. Or when something happens to the Armenians in Syria, they also get injured. So the critical junctures get them out of their shell in one way or another. And the final part is the dual-pronged approach. I also choose uh, foreign policy divergence, the homeland parties when they're impacting on the environment and then how the people manage to broker, to uh, channel. So here the broker was a person I interviewed in Brussels who was saying that uh, when they are planning for something that is happening in Palestine, Basically, they are looking into reaching out to the European institutions, reaching out locally, but also they try to deliver demonstrations at the same time. And it was also interesting when, for example, there was a parliamentary discussion going on on how to recognize Armenian genocide in Sweden, which did happen in 2010. Similarly, Armenian diaspora entrepreneurs were saying, yes, we're doing this in the parliament, but whenever we try to organize through other people the demonstration, so basically to sandwich uh, the politicians from both sides. Um, locals are also engaged in this. I mean, there was, I was giving an example here about a person who, was, uh, who managed to migrate to the Netherlands, kind of like really integrating into society, but was approached one way or another by, by the K LDK on the one side and by the KLA, the more radical group on the other. So while he was like lobbying institutions in, in The Hague, he was also bringing up a humanitarian convoy, convoy to, to uh, Albania. So it is, uh, it is that it's not mutually exclusive, right? The, the whole discussion earlier uh, about who is mobilizing, whether they're mobilizing, it's really getting a, a bigger picture. And uh, finally, I think the distant is the uh, Quite, quite a lot of people are engaged in these uh, um, right of return networks, which are in the Palestinian case. And I have, this is uh, some pictures I took at the Palestinian conference uh, that was taking place in Berlin when I was in, uh, on fieldwork 2015, quite contentious because people think that maybe some of them are associated with terrorist organizations and then others are disputing it and then uh, the environment, the, the, the state is allowing uh, these demonstrations to uh, this uh, conference to uh, happen um, on an annual basis. It's like a big important uh, event uh, for the Palestinian diaspora. But you could see, for example, there the distant who is a medical person, has a medical doctoral degree and engages completely into delivering support and delivering services and so on. They don't care that much what's happening in Sweden or what's happening in France. It's happening mostly in that field and internationally. And the final part is this Palestinian man in France who um, was um, engaged particularly in the hostland and he said, oh, these are, um, we have little cultural events here organized uh, by the unions, uh, but we are not Daesh, we are not uh, anything that is really problematic, so we want to be concerned with our country and, uh, and do not want to be involved in issues of that. So we do have people who are reached out to, but basically say no and stay uh, on their own work. I know this has been a big, um, probably new and intense discussion, but I just want to highlight a couple of points. The first, I think that it is uh, um, first of the discussion that brings the individual level to that kind of depth. Um, we can have in the Q&A session whether identity-based elements may not matter as well. Um, it's about lobbying in Europe when it happens, how it happens. Um, it is about um, uh, theoretical insight at the intersection of different literatures, and you see how this typological theory is managing to integrate them in, in a coherent whole. Uh, it is about autonomy of the diaspora entrepreneurs that basically nobody has spoken about. And it is about um, eventually recommendations uh, which uh, uh, this may bring about the individual dimension and connections of different people to different places. 
Please, if you're interested in our work from the entire project, look at the three special issues we came up recently, 2017, 18, and next year is coming the last one. And they have much more than our own cases. They also discuss issues of, uh, uh, in Tamil diaspora, in, uh, in, in Syrian diaspora. The one is about the contextual dimensions and the socio-spatial dynamics in general. That was in general of ethno, uh, ethnic and migration studies. The other is about sending states, which I um, coordinated with Gerasimus Tsarapas about how sending states and non-state actors within them are reaching out to diasporas abroad. And then diaspora mobilizations in transitional justice, which I think is culmination of our work, uh, is the work that I have co-edited with my former student, Janeta Karabekovic. Maria, thank you very, very much. For, uh, thank you. Thank you.